Greetings all, I would like to welcome you to the Culture Show with Kulu, your host, every Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on iBlack Pharaoh Radio. Welcome to the Culture Show. The Culture Show. The Culture Show. The Culture Show. The Kemet expert, Dr. Sally Ann Ashton, is here on the line and she's going to talk to us about different stance on ancient Egypt than most Egyptologists do. Um, and it's, you you kind of guys, you guys stand by the African origins with which with a lot of quote unquote Afrocentric, so to speak. Have you gotten any flack for that, that stance you've taken? Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I was really quite fortunate when I, I, I left Egyptology formally in 2015 um, to retrain as a psychologist because my research interests had changed and I got really quite tired really of the discipline. Um, I felt that it was kind of stuck in the past and, and I didn't agree with the way that it was often presented. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, I think really when I started to um, put materials online, um, which is at the Fitzwilliam Museum where I was um, a curator um, for 12 years. It was at that point where I started getting sort of people emailing me, emailing my institution, um, sort of even in some cases threatening me um, because of what I was saying, saying that what I was doing was dangerous, um, that it was, and I think initially I was actually very shocked um, because first of all, you know, I, I'm not saying that I, I know everything, you know, no academic can. We, we all have areas that we specialize in and we're always constantly learning. But to have people completely dismiss the fact that I was working as a professional Egyptologist at the University of Cambridge, that I had a PhD in Egyptology, um, simply on the basis that, that they knew that they were correct. And, and I think, you know, I understand more about that kind of behavior now as a psychologist. Um, and I obviously understand that um, there's obviously an agenda here, which is um, a white extremist, white nationalist agenda. And I also understand that people who troll people on the internet, um, there's a correlation between that kind of behavior and personality disorders like psychopathy, um, tendencies towards sadism and Machiavellianism. So I understand a lot more about the kind of people that, that do this um, now that I've retrained um, and in the field. But I think nevertheless, um, I was quite surprised and remain surprised actually that um, people feel so strongly about this. I think there are very few other ancient cultures that, that so many different people want to claim. Right, right. You know, in, 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 in ancient Greece, the ancient Greeks, they saw the ancient Egyptians and they described them, obviously, because they knew that these people looked completely different from themselves. Can you talk a little bit about the ancient Greeks' perspectives of the ancient Egyptians of Kemet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the ancient Greeks, um, many ancient Greek um, scientists and um, I guess their equivalents to academics today went to, to Egypt because they recognized it as a much older civilization. They recognized it, um, although it was very different to theirs, um, there was a great deal of respect. Um, they didn't try to appropriate it and that appropriation comes much later. It's really when Egyptology is forming as a discipline that it starts to be appropriated by um, by Europeans. Um, but every time that they, they sort of depict somebody from Egypt, um, it's always somebody, and it's almost like a, a caricature, it's always somebody with very, very dark skin. Um, sometimes they will have exaggerated features that they felt that people had at that time. And in actual fact, um, they often, uh, the ancient Greeks often 
compare the Egyptians with the Ethiopians. They seem to sort of use the two um, interchangeably. Of course, Ethiopian comes from the um, Greek meaning burnt face. Um, so that gives you an idea of how, how they were clearly um, aware that their complexion was completely different. And I think also the Greeks and the Romans, um, they, you know, they saw Egypt almost as this kind of um, mystery, sort of mythological sort of land. When you see some of the mosaics, uh-huh. From the late sort of Greek period and the Hellenistic period and in the Roman period, you'll see all these kind of exotic animals depicted. Um, animals that I guess some people had described to them, like a, a hippopotamus, that obviously the artist had never seen, so the proportions aren't quite right, and crocodiles and things like that. So it was a very different culture, and I think for me, um, you know, as I say, that was my introduction to ancient Egypt. That that was how I saw the ancient Egyptians. I saw them as the Greeks and Romans saw them. So it was very surprising for me um, as I started to kind of retrain within this kind of new field, um, because I was still seeing the statues. I was still seeing um, that the culture is very different. Um, I was still seeing the people as a different population to the, the Greeks and the Romans. And all of a sudden, I started to become much more aware that people were somehow trying to depict this ancient African culture in a completely different light, with, with no evidence at all. Right, right. Now, there is there seems to be a great connection between ancient Nubia and the in and later Egypt and early Egyptology. They sought to seem to make Nubia black, the black part of uh, North Africa. And then you have Egypt as the quote unquote white um, part of uh, North Africa. Can you talk a little bit about Egyptologist perspective between Nubia and um, ancient Egypt as well? Well, this is where we start to get into the hypocrisy, isn't it? Because, I mean, you know, we know that the borders were, were sort of, you know, variable in ancient times, and, and we know that the people are quite happy to refer to um, the ancient people from Kush, from from what's now kind of Sudan, and the region of kind of Nubia, they're they're fine with referring to them, so we'll get titles of books, you know, Black Pharaohs. But then at the same time, that's almost removing, you know, Egypt from from that sort of Africanness. And they then equally, and this is where the hypocrisy comes in, they will say to um, people, who will say, well, you know, ancient Egypt was a black culture too, both in terms of um, its ethnicity and also the right racialized identity of people. And at that point, I've noticed that many institutions and some Egyptologists will say, well, you can't use a modern racialized term. And my point is, well, you've just used it for the people of Sudan, so why can't we use it for the people of ancient Egypt? Right. And that's where the hypocrisy really starts to kind of hit home. And time and time again, we have people... Um, I wrote on my blog a couple of weeks ago, you know, somebody again trying to justify the use of, of, of this, this term for the people who were further south, but not the people from, from ancient Kemet. And it's really becoming very tired. And, and, and in addition to that, I find it quite offensive that an ostensibly white discipline is telling people from groups that are connected to that ancient culture how they should define themselves I mean that's that's really not acceptable to me yeah yeah not me neither and this is one of the things that I have taken a stance on now some believe some Egyptologists do believe that ancient Nubia actually predated ancient Egypt do you is that the same is that a, a, a normal theory that most Egyptologists take well, we certainly have sort of evidence. So people tend to, to look at um, sort of culture really by sort of all the evidence that we have. And one of the key sort of points of evidence that we have are things like sort of pottery, early pottery. So there is um, sort of the pottery that we find from sort of um, around the sort of cartoon hospital sort of sites um, that kind of predates um, the pottery that we get from kind of um, what's now southern Egypt. But there is so many, you know, connections between these two cultures and you know it's very clear that it's very different when the 25th dynasty you know when we have people from from the south moving into to Egypt further north into Kemet to control that country we don't get the same um, change in um, representations of the rulers um, and changes even some small cultural changes that we see when we have other foreign dynasties ruling 
it, it remains pretty much. In fact, it actually goes back almost to kind of like a renaissance, um, if I can use that word. Um, so we end up with sort of statuary and sculpture being produced. It's almost going back to a golden age. Um, and so the rulers in the 25th dynasty, um, who are of course Kushites, it's as if they wanted to almost sort of bring what had happened, you know, north and sort of started to go its own way, I suppose, bring it sort of back to its, its original form. So I think, you know, that's very telling um, in its own right that, that we don't have that sort of, we don't see any differences in terms of when the Ptolemies, for instance, later um, ruled in Egypt, they continue Egyptian traditions and um, are also represented in a traditional way. But we start to see sculptures that show them as Europeans with their hair sort of um, depicted, which is not something we normally find on representations of, of royals. So I think there is a, there's a huge difference there that we see. It's almost as if they transition much more easily um, because their cultures were linked and associated. And, and of course, as I said, the borders um, change um, throughout the kind of very long history that we have of Egypt. Yeah, and you know, it seems that um, a lot of people have, and particularly modern day Egyptians, feel that they are the descendants of the pharaohs. And when you talk about Mediterranean and then you talk about uh, other African nations surrounding Egypt, um, what would you say traditionally were similar? Would you say the African nations that surrounded uh, Kemet were similar to Kemet, or would you say? Kemet was more similar to the Mediterranean in, in traditions and culture. Well, I think you know, this, this, I find this kind of this this reference to the Mediterranean really problematic. You know, it's it's, it's a small part of, of what was ancient Egypt, and, and yes, there was trade with people from from further north, from outside of Africa. But you know, if we look at sort of many of the the New Kingdom sort of tombs, for instance, where we get depictions of people from even further south. Um, we get, you know, depictions of people bringing sort of offerings from, from further south. You know, it's very clear that the Egyptians had a much earlier sort of, you know, sort of very strong relationship to these people in terms of, of trade and, and also culture and, and sort of ethnicity as well. So I think, you know, I, I have questioned many, many people um, that, you know, on this use of this term Mediterranean, what exactly does it mean, you know? I, I really struggle with it, and I, I don't think it's something that we should be using. It's almost as if it's a, I don't know whether it's, it's I, I suspect it may be a conscious, maybe it's an unconscious attempt, it's a, it's a bias in many respects, um, because it's an attempt to make people look north. And of course the other issue is that, you know, Egyptology is very much taught in a bubble. You know, when you study Egyptology at university, that's what you study. And, you know, some colleagues have broken away from that, certainly archaeologists, um, People like David Wengrow um, is a professor at University College London. I um, think his book was 2006. When he looked at the archaeology of early Egypt, he started to he used um, I suppose sort of anthropological sort of um, methods and models and, and looked elsewhere. And, and part of the problem is that people are just not looking in other parts. They're deliberately looking to the north. Um, and you know if they can't learn and understand about the cultures that are further south and are surrounding Egypt and Africa, then they really need to be working with academics who specialize in those cultures. Because we can't keep just looking at, at, at sort of ancient Egypt in isolation. It wasn't in isolation, we know that. And we can't keep deliberately pushing um, you know, the kind of vision further north rather than looking at associated cultures in the south and to the east. Right. Now, a lot of people have also have said uh, that Egypt shares a lot of customs with modern day Ethiopia, obviously Sudan, um, and, and even some in Mali and Saint Central Africa as well. Would you agree to that? Or can you talk about those kind of similarities between those cultures with, with ancient Egypt? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think for me, you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm not an Africanist, you know, I have sort of worked and, and obviously learned from many people who are. But I think part of the problem is, you know, we don't have as much archaeology from, from some of those regions. And when we do have archaeology, certainly from Ethiopia, it tends to often focus on the more recent, um, still ancient, but more recent um, sort of periods. So I think, you know, we can't... Um, 
say that you know lack of, of, of direct sort of comparisons or lack of evidence of trade in those regions means that it didn't happen. I think we need to be open to the idea and accept that we're still very limited in terms of what we know. Um, there's still you know relatively little sort of archaeology that's actually been excavated. So I think it's really important to look to those areas. I know that there's some really important work going on with, with, with languages, you know, looking at the links between different African languages. I'm not a linguist, it's not something that, that I um, personally would ever get involved with, but I think that's fascinating because what we're doing is we're opening out and we're, we're actually looking at, at Egypt within the context of its neighbours. You know, it, the country was never in isolation and I think it's completely wrong that people insist on trying to study it in that way. Yeah. Yes, because, you know, when people talk about Egypt, they talk about it as it's in the same borders today as it was in the ancient times. Obviously, <laughs> those borders that we have today in Africa didn't exist back then particularly. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, but, I mean, isn't this true the whole of Africa? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, Europe colonized Africa and decided where these sort of, you know, modern countries should be. You know, they split up sort of cultural groups, and I became really aware of this when I did the um, Origins of the Afro Code project. You know, we were looking at sort of codes um, throughout Africa and, and throughout African history, and also looking at codes of the diaspora. But it became really clear that you would have identical codes across maybe um, sort of three or four of you know, these modern countries that were formed by the colonists. And it was very clear that, you know, a single cultural group had been divided and split up because Europe had decided to colonize Africa in a way that it saw appropriate. So for me, this, this, this is just an, an extension of, of that sort of colonization of the whole of Africa. Right, right. All right, we're going to take a quick call right quick. So Dr. Ashton, we can keep you right here. I'm going to let this call come through. And call it from 716-427. You're on iBlack Ferro Radio on the Culture Show. What's up? What's your question? Okay. Okay, so Dr. Ashton, the question was here that why do you feel that modern-day Egyptians do not identify with, quote-unquote, sub-Saharan Africa or Africa, period? And you're not the only one who's faced that racism and those that hate mail and threats because I also experienced that myself with my novel 
Um, and you do notice that coming from Aswan, where you find the more Egyptians uh, who consider themselves to be the native Egyptians, in your opinion, is it are the Egyptians of quote unquote the Nubian Egyptians? Are they considered to be in Egyptology from an Egyptologist standpoint? Are they considered to be the descendants of these uh, ancient people? Um, I, I don't think that really people have, have done a lot of. Um, I don't think Egyptologists have done a lot of work with with Nubian people. I mean, obviously there um, is the fantastic um, museum at Aswan, um, the Nubian Museum, which um, is, is amazing in that you know it, it's really about sort of retaining and supporting sort of Nubian cultural heritage. Um, and I was lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time um, with the director there, um, Dr. Uh, McGuid, who, who is Nubian himself, and I think that's very important. Um, so I think I think that, that, yes, there are, I think people would probably be more likely to see connections, but I think when, again, we, we're talking about labels, aren't we? So we label, um, so those people identify as Nubian people, um, and, but that's a relatively modern term. So I think, again, um, there's that distinction that's kind of made somehow in Egyptology between living people and the ancient people. And this problem, I know that when I switched to do some anthropology based work, uh, all of a sudden I asked people if I was getting things right or wrong. You know, as anthropologists, as archaeologists, we can't do it because of the the ancient people are no longer here. Right. We can't say, are we interpreting this correctly, or actually we're just impacted with our view. And of course, we would have with our view when we don't interpret something because we have to something make sense in the world. So I think, you know, even acknowledging that would actually start for me in the discipline. Even acknowledging that we project onto cultures that we're studying um, and look at it through our own lens and that lens through our experiences so even acknowledging that for me would be a starting point okay okay we're going to take another quick call so hold on dr ashton i'll repeat the question when it comes out and we've got another caller calling from 716 and can you tell us your question Okay, that caller didn't want to say anything. Okay, so um, Dr. Ashton, so would you, as an Egyptologist, consider ancient Egypt a part of black history? Yeah, absolutely I would. I don't think there's any question at all. Um, I mean, all, all we have to do is look at the, the depictions of the ancient people and know I think again we come back to this can you can we or can't we use the modern racialized term of black and absolutely it's okay for people to use that if that's what they if that's what they're saying absolutely I, I don't think we can like I say dictate to people how they um, rationalize or, or how they they interact with with a, an ancient culture that's that's not appropriate so for me absolutely I've always seen it as part of, of black history I've always seen it as part of Africa and I think it's I think for, for me it doesn't actually make sense if we try and remove it from Africa it doesn't make sense historically it doesn't make sense culturally to me if we try and take it out of Africa I just want to go back though to one thing um, sort of about sort of um, the, we're talking about contemporary Egyptian people and, and one thing um, I realised um, over the past few years is that you know a lot of um, the people who contact people like you and I and, and complain about sort of you know how we're presenting and interpreting the past, they claim to be um, Egyptian people, but in fact they're not. They're actually um, white extremists, white nationalists pretending to be from Egypt, and this comes into their kind of narrative. So they then accuse you of being racist in terms because we're interpreting the Mexican culture. And I think we need to be very careful here about sort of humanising you know, contemporary Egyptian people because actually what's really happening is that some of these extremists, white extremists who have nothing to do with Egypt or Africa uh, are actually trying to adopt these kind of persons online to be that they're somehow speaking up culture uh, and trying to speak 
say that something else is part of that, that's the, that nationalist um, narrative. Right, right. And, you know, I've, and, and you're right, you know, because, you know, the, the Egyptians that I've spoke, spoken with have been very much agreeable. And a lot of them have said things like there were a lot of invasions that happened in the later years after the Pharaonic period, probably more so after the 31st dynasty and the 32nd dynasty where the Greeks came in. So um, there were some a lot of Egyptian mixing and, um, and mingling. What would you say is your favorite um, dynasty of Kemet? Um, I like the 25th dynasty um, because I, I, I'm really interested in the women. I'm interested in their role uh, as the gods' wives of the moon. Um, a lot of my work was done on the later um, dynasties, the Ptolemaic period, of course. That's um, what I, I covered for my PhD. Um, but I, I find all of the, the different dynasties really fascinating, and it's such a long history. I know when I kind of changed from studying classic to Egyptology, it was almost somehow overwhelming because the history was so long in, in, in for, for Kemet, for ancient Egypt. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that um, you can really see the kind of development of, of both kind of culture and also um, the art and, 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 and also the, the material culture as well. So you have a consistency, but you also have um, change and development. And, and I think that that's just amazing that we have a degree of consistency across so many thousands of years of history. It's, it's quite in, incredible to me. I, I'm not sure that there are many other cultures, um, certainly from the ancient world, that, that can sort of that have that. So now we have, we see a lot of similarities in the United States with the obelisk and the obelisk in, in Washington, um, of the seal of Horace on the back of the dollar bill. <laughs> I mean, it's so many different similarities that came from ancient Kemet. Can you talk a little bit about how, uh, on the influence Kemet had on the entire world after the Pharaonic period? It's just, you know, it's extraordinary, and I think, you know, if, uh, I know you, you've been to Egypt, and I think if you, you know, if you stand, you know, in, in the sort of hallway, you know, of, of the, the Hyperstar Hall at Karnak Temple, and you, it, you're just completely overawed, or you stand at, at the pyramids, you know, you're completely overawed at the scale, and just how old these monuments are, I mean, it, it's, it's quite extraordinary, and I'm not surprised, you know, that the people... Uh, you know, and again, I don't like this idea that you know Egypt, ancient Egypt was discovered. You know, the people that were living there were pretty much aware of the culture and, and the history um, before the Europeans arrived. So again, it's that kind of colonial standpoint. But you know, how can people not? How can people fail to be impressed um, by the achievements of the ancient people? Um, I, it, it's it's quite extraordinary, and you know, I, I'd recommend you know if anybody. It, you should go to Egypt, you know, and, and see some of these things because it's really hard to get a perspective until you're actually standing there next to or, or in these these ancient monuments. Um, and again, I think we forget things like the, the mud brick structures. So some of the Middle Kingdom um, pyramids, for instance, that are made out of mud brick, you know, also, again, if you go to, um, to Sudan, um, and look at the Tufus, you know, these massive sort of, you know, sort of very old, thousands of years old sort of structures made out of mud brick, and they're, they're just remarkable. And I think it's, 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 I understand why people wanted to appropriate this culture, because it's just so extraordinary and, and so very powerful as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, and let's talk about, let's shift gears for a second, and let's talk about, you know, in my, my novel, I, Black Pharaoh, Rise to Power, um, a lot of the story was centered around uh, Queen Hepshetsu. And let's, so let's talk about the queens, the queens of ancient Egypt and the power that they have. Did they, you know, it seems that um, in my own thorough research of ancient Africa as a whole, it seems that Africa has produced more queen rulers than any other region on the earth. So let's talk about Egypt. How, what was their view of ancient Egypt? How was their view of, of women? Well, women played a very important role. And again, this is where we see lots of connections in terms of, you know, we often, for the, the 
gods, for instance, we always get a family group. So we get a male, a female, and then a child. Um, and the female deities, of course, have as much power as, as the male deities. They're equally important. So again, that's a connection that we sort of have with, with other even contemporary um, and sort of traditional African religions. I think, interestingly, it's, it's quite... It's, in terms of the, the role of the royal women, um, their titles always go back to the male, so it can be, you know, king's sister, um, great royal wife. Um, so there wasn't actually an ancient Egyptian word for queen, there, there wasn't an equivalent. They, they had titles that were connected to their role. But as I said, um, their roles were quite distinct, um, and I think that's important to, to remember. It, they were roles that females um, occupied and were equally important to the male roles. Um, particularly when we get, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have the God's wife, Amun, um, and, and we see that very clearly um, in terms of the passing on of the title within the 25th dynasty of females and at Medinu, Medinu Harbu, um on the West Bank at the temple there, we, we have a small chapel um, where we can see um, we can see this sort of um, process of passing on from the living, um, from the deceased um, God's wife to, to the new God's wife. So that came with quite a lot of power and, and wealth and, and, and authority. Would you say the Egyptian role for women was a lot, was more enhanced compared to European queens? Yeah, absolutely, I would. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, there are, again, we have some strong European females, so Alexander the Great's mother was a force to be reckoned with, but I think that was more about her personality rather than her actual role. Um, so we, we see very sort of strong and, and distinct roles, um, I think is what I'm getting at, for the um, women in Egypt. And I think it's interesting that even, you know, regular women, uh, they could own their own sort of property and businesses, they could divorce their husbands if they chose to do so. Um, and again, the role of priestess, you know, the, um, was very, very important um, in lots of different parts of the ancient religion. So there are lots of parallels in, in that respect um, to what we, we see in elsewhere in, in other um, African cultures from lots of different periods. And um, I think what's interesting when we look at the um, depictions of the royal women, um, Kushite royal women, that we get on those kind of later um, temples in, in the northern part of what's now Sudan, they take on an even more dominant role. So we actually see them appearing on the front of the temple in kind of smiting scenes with their husbands. Mm -hmm. um, so their husband is on one side and they're on the other. And that's something different. That's quite distinct. That's something that we don't see um, in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. now, you, we, now you're talking about these queens. You know, I, I've mentioned Hepshetsu. Uh, Queen Tia was one of those queens. What are, are they? How about how many would you do you recall um, African queens or Egyptian queens that had somewhat absolute power? Um, well, we have sort of had chefs that obviously kind of ruling. Um, but I think we need to be careful here. You know, again, it's a, it can be about kind of projecting almost what we see as as kind of power onto the past. So, you know, these women had very important, not only kind of roles as royalty, but also, um, you know, religious roles. And many of them were actually seen to be divine. They were divine in, in terms of their, um, their status and their role, but they were also divine individuals as well. And we certainly see that starting to increase from the, um, from the new kingdom onwards um, in terms of royal females and their importance. So I think rather than kind of looking at, you know, sort of almost kind of power of an individual in the way that we would kind of see it today, again, looking at sort of how the deities of ancient Egypt functioned, it, it's almost kind of like this kind of equality of kind of needing to have the male and the female um, sort of together, um, and that being a strong, um, a strong foundation and a, a strong pairing almost. So I think we need to slightly shift how, how we kind of view power and how we view um, importance in, in that kind of sense. Mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Ashton, our last question here today is going to be on the ancient Egyptian seamen, uh, seafaring and, and traveling on the seas of the Niles, the Nile, 
Um, and there's been a lot of talk coming into um, Egypt and more from the Africanists, I would say, about this possibility of Egyptians possibly making contact with some in South, South America. Now, I've never saw any proof of this, but I, there is some similarities in architectures found in South America that's very identical to ancient Egypt. Have you heard any of this? And, what, and, and then let's talk a little bit about ancient Egyptian um, and, and their, their, their uh, sh bowmanship, or not bowmanship, but shipmanship, so to speak, traveling through uh -huh. the seas. Um, no, I think we need to be very careful as, as an archaeologist, you know, um, you know, many different cultures can produce um, sort of shapes, forms that, that can be similar. You know, what we would really be looking for um, if we wanted to see um, a connection would be, you know, material exchanges, so trade between those two. People always leave things behind when, when they travel somewhere. Um, it's, it's just what human beings naturally do. It can be, you know, if you look at the, the sort of deserts of, of, of kind of Egypt, then there's, there's so much pottery there. It's, it's, it's unbelievable from sort of ancient times. So I think we need to be very careful about saying, well, that looks like this, so therefore there must be a connection. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, as an archaeologist, would want to see far more evidence. Um, but the, the, the boats that the ancient Egyptians made, and, you know, I'm sure... Um, if you went to um, sort of um, when you were in Egypt, but you saw some of those very early boats, the old kingdom boats that, that were there, that were buried with people. You know, they 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 had a, um, a really high standard of, of manufacturing vessels. But I think the other thing that I would kind of say, whilst we're on the subject of, of sailing, you know, we need to remember which way the Nile flows. It does not flow from north to the south. So the natural way that people are going to be moving up the Nile is from the south heading north mm -hmm. and you know I think just going back to this, uh, this over focus on the Mediterranean coast you know that's not actually the way that the Nile flows um, mm -hmm. and given that we know there's a connection with the south we need to be thinking very carefully about what what would naturally happen which way would people naturally go when they're actually traveling right right all right, Dr. Ashton, we thank you for being on the show. Now, if anyone wanted to contact you, or before we even talk about that, let's let's say, what projects do you got going on currently at the moment? Okay, so at the moment, um, I am actually sort of working with, with some of my colleagues. Um, I'm sort of coming back to kind of Egyptology, really, to just think about, you know, how we can, we can resituate it within Africa, and how we can also get the African framework accepted as a legitimate framework rather than looking at a, a purely sort of European framework, which is what many people are, are still unfortunately doing. So that's something that I'm getting back into. Um, the rest of my research is actually in my new field, so it's actually looking at um, juvenile offending, and I specialize in, in, in researching violence offending among sort of juveniles and, and how we can work with those people. And one thing I have done over the years, though, is actually using, you know, positive black history, using African history um, to work with people to um, help them to rethink their identity, people who have ended up in the criminal justice system, um, who may have um, been given only part of a history of, of sort of black, black history. Um, so I've used um, Egyptology for, for years now. Um, in those environments to actually support people in terms of just rethinking about how they, they can view themselves and their position within world history. So I think it's really important that we do start to shift um, towards accepting. Um, I mean, most of us who work in that field know, um, you and I both see it as an African culture, but but also in just sharing that and giving people evidence to also do the same. Because I think it's, it's more than just an ancient history. It's something that is important in terms of people's modern day um, self concepts and identity as well. Right, and as and, and that's very uh, good that you said that because that is the mission of I Black Pharaoh. Our mission is to restore the African origins of ancient Egypt and to bring pride to those of African the African diaspora, because Africa has completely been separated from Kemet or ancient yes. Egypt and. As you talk about that identity, you know, being able for Africans, 
worldwide to be able to connect to Kemet, possibly that knowledge possibly can make people think a little bit differently before they make that choice that have put them into the, to the juvenile justice system, as you said. So I absolutely love that you said that. That's amazing. All right, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Ashton, where can the people find you? Um, so they can contact me via my Kemet Expert blog, um, and um, they can just sort of leave um, a comment. All the comments come through to me to be checked before they're, um, they're put online because there are lots of racist comments, which I have no time for on the blog, um, so they just get deleted. Um, so if people want to contact me, they can do via the blog. Um, if they just say private message, and then I'll, I'll respond back to them if they want to send me their email address. Okay, okay. Dr. Ashton was on the show today. Dr. Ashton, we greatly thank you for being with us and please continue your great work. It's, it, it, it may seem at times that it's a struggle and the world is against you, but you, are, you have taken a stand and that stand, you have growing others like myself who stand as allies with you. So please continue to do this great work that you're doing. Oh, thank you so much and thank you for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Ashton. Oh, that was Dr. Sally Ashton we had on the show today in, in a very good interview. I know we had some te technical difficulties with connecting her. She's all the way in.